the body of Christ. And uh, the scripture that I'm going to start off with is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. This is in the English Standard Version. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. And, and kind of what stirred me to go this route is lately we've been dealing with these, these um, exemption, religious exemption certificates that we have to have for this ungodly mandate that they're putting on us. And it's interesting because it's really a tack on the body in that regard. Um, and so I've been approached um, with the ability to sign these exemptions as a pastor, um, to sign some of these exemptions. And, and the question kind of came up, well, what if they're not members of your church? And I said, but what if they're a member of the body? If, if you're born again, you're a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And that's something that he did. And so my whole point is this, is I'm not sure we sure, truly understand what the meaning behind the body of Christ is. Do we really comprehend the magnitude of that saying, that you and I are the body of Christ? You and I are the body of Christ. And in verse 12, it starts out, it says, For just as the body is one, we're one. Christ in Christ, we are one. And, and I know when you look across the landscape of Christianity, it doesn't look that way. It looks like there's different denominations and different sects, and some denominations have different denominations inside of the denominations. And you know, I was I was never Lutheran, but you hear somebody say, "Well, I was raised Lutheran," and then the question is, "Well, were you ECLA or UCLA or F?" Yeah, you know, and I'm like, "Well, huh?" And and so it's really a a unfortunate fragmentation of the body of Christ. And that's why one of the things that I've always encouraged us not to do is to um, point out faults and failures or what we perceive as faults and failures in, in other parts of the body. Now, I recognize that we have differences of doctrines and some say tongues is over and some say tongues is of the devil and this and that and we believe in tongues. And, and so there's differences in concept and ideas and structurals, but I, I've always said, if Jesus Christ is Lord to that person or to that body, if Jesus Christ is the exalted one, then they're part of the body. They're part of the body. It's, it's just like a, a family can have you know, four children, and, and two of the children are, are uber-liberal and two are conservative. They're still the family. They just have different beliefs. But they're still the family. Now, it does make different dynamics around the supper table at Thanksgiving, but nonetheless. Um, but, the, but the basis of it is love. You know? and, and so, because we're one body, we find out that Christ, who is the head, is going to nurture that body. He is the head and he is the nurturing. He's going to look over and care for and take care of his body. No matter where it's at or, or what it's doing, whether it's in error or in absolute truth, that doesn't change his love and his desire to care for that body. We are one, and that's what Paul's trying to convey to the Corinthians. And it's, it's amazing as I started looking into this, how many different letters that he wrote that this is a big theme in it. This is a big concept in the letters, and we'll look at a few of them, but there's way more than I'm going to touch base on today. And so he says, For just as the body is one, 
and has many members. See, he, he recognizes and he knows that, listen, it's, it's one in its, its unity, but it's made up of many parts. You know, it, it's very similar to the human body. You got red blood cells and white blood cells, and you got kidneys and livers and lungs and brains and nervous systems and all of the things that make up the one body. And so Paul says, hey, listen, we have many members, but we're all one. And, and I think this is that, that comprehension that we need to really recognize is that, you know, the Baptists and the Lutherans and uh, whatever. It, like I said, if Jesus Christ is Lord, we're one body. We're many members in one body. And, and the reason that I, I stress that is because I would love for all of us to walk in the fullness of that. That when we meet somebody and, and, and we're having conversation with them and we find out that they go to this church or that church, that, that we have that, that oneness in thought, that we have that unity in thought, that this is a brother or sister in Christ. And, and just as Christ nurtures the body, we also should be a nurturing aspect of the body. You know, we need to, to recognize that and know that, that, there, um, that there's no portion of the body that's an island unto itself. And I've heard of denominations that really think that they're the only ones, you know, that have the truth. And, and that was one of the first things that really appeared to me. So I'm in prison. I'm just about ready to leave. I'm born again. I've been involved in Bible studies, and there were different churches that would come down. And so uh, there was one church that was there. Uh, it, was, it was a very um, external church, I'm going to call it. Uh, they believed if you didn't pray in tongues, you weren't saved. Uh, you had to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. And, and so I was talking to this person from the church and saying, hey, I get out in a couple months, so on and so forth. And, and what they said to me is, well, you need to come to our church because we're the only one that teaches the truth. And, and just on the surface, it's like, really, there's just one church of all the churches? Now, remember, I, I, I was raised Catholic, and, and I wasn't very involved in the Catholic church and, and got out of it fairly young, so I wasn't really indoctrinated. There wasn't a lot of things that, that I need to drag to the, the garbage can of my belief system. But I, I just knew that that wasn't right. There's just no way that could be right. And, and so then there was another church down, and, and I kind of said the same thing, and I said, hey, pray about it, and, and if the Lord leads you to our church, we'd love to have you come. See, you know, that was comforting. That was, that was, it wasn't the fingers on the chalkboard like the first answer was. And, and that's the church I ended up going to for 16 years. We were there. And um, so I became part of this this church body, if that's what you want to call it. And, and so it was realizing that there isn't an individual church, there isn't one portion that's an island unto itself. We are part of the larger whole. We're part of the composite whole. And, and we need to recognize that and, and you know, walk in that fact. It says, so I'm going to read it again, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. I mean, he's really stressing this. He's really trying to get this through to them uh, that, that we're one body. And I think part of this stems from the fact that you have to realize that under the old system, under the old covenant, the Jews were God's people, the Israelites were God's people, and the Gentiles, or a lot of times referred to as the uncircumcised, because the circumcised had the covenant. The uncircumcised didn't. And so now Christ comes, he dies, he raises again and starts this new thing, this new covenant, this new testament. And, and so the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, are now being called in, welcomed in to this new body, this new thing that God was doing. And, and so as he's talking to the Corinthians, who, who generally would have been the uncircumcised, 
he's trying to convey to them, hey, listen, there's just one body. God, didn't, God doesn't have the, the Israelites over here and you're over here. There's one body now, and he, and he talks about that in here. It says, they're, they're one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek or slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So when we comprehend that, we realize that we're the body, he's the head, and he is the motivational force behind us. He's the one that moves us to do what we do. You know, for example, when... when when the Lord had spoke to Jenny and Randy about grace and truth, there were some directives that, that the Holy Spirit gave for this body. One of the things was is that we were not to pass the plate. We were to, we were to and, and I loved it when we first came, it was a, a Folgers coffee can with the lid hacked out of it. And I think we still have it as a memorabilia up in the cupboard. And, and, it's, and it said, I don't remember what it even said on it. Cheerful giving. And, and that was one of the directives that was given for this body. And to this day, that's how we do it. There's been situations where that tried to get changed. But it stayed the same because that was a directive. Another directive was the food. God spoke to them about feed the people. Feed my sheep. Feed them here, feed them there. Amen. And, and aren't we thankful that we have food afterwards? Because that's where we really, this body really gets to know each other. It's exciting in that regard. Um, but we're moved by the head. And could you imagine if the body as a whole, in the world, those that profess Jesus Christ as Lord would unite and move as one? it would be the greatest force on the planet. There would be nothing that could overcome it, not a thing. And so um, the way I like to look at it, you know, when, when we're born again, we become part of this body. God does that. And, and, of course, Scripture talks about how we're adopted. We're not left as orphans, but God adopts us and brings us into the body. And, and the way I like to look at it is, is everybody that's born... God has signed his name on the adoption paper. All he's waiting for is you and I to sign our names to it, and we're adopted in. Amen. He's done his part. He wants all to be adopted into this body. So he's signed his portion of the adoption papers, and when we call on the name of Jesus, it's as if we're signing our portion of it, and boom, we're adopted into the family. We are the body of Christ. We're one in him. And um, that's why we, we can call them pre-saved or pre-adopted. Scripture says that God would have none to perish, but all to come to repentance. And that just completely knocks out the doctrine that, that some are predestined to be saved and some aren't. God would want all, all to come to repentance. And so in, in verse 13, uh, it says, For in one spirit we are all bop, baptized into one body. And um, so we notice that for in one spirit. There isn't many spirits. There isn't a, a, even a second spirit. There's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. There's one spirit. And it's in that spirit that we're baptized or immersed into that body, into the body that we're in. And so the very minute you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved, Scripture says. And when you're saved, you're immersed into this body, into one body. And, and this baptism is not a, a baptism of the Spirit, which we've spoke on, which, which has evidence of speaking in tongues and things of that nature. This is the baptism into the body. There are multiple baptisms in, in Scripture. This is when we are immersed or baptized into the body of Christ. It's something that he did at our salvation, and it's a finished transaction, uh, a never to be changed. You know, and, and when we comprehend that and see that, 
you know, we can start to, to walk in it. That's the big thing is to get the information and then put it to use. And, and the big thing for us to put to use is, is not really the understanding that we're in the body, but that there's others in the body. That there's others in the body. And when we're out, uh, you know, in the highways and byways, and, and have you ever noticed when you're talking with somebody and there's just like something in your knower by their demeanor, by their words, that, I think this guy's saved. I think this guy knows Jesus Christ. Well, what that is, is that's your spirit, the spirit that is talking of here, recognizing and seeing and understanding the spirit in the other person. And there's this, what scripture calls koinonia, it's a fellowship. It's a oneness that only the body of Christ has. And, and that's what happens, you know, when, when Bob says, hey, greeting time, all of a sudden the koinonia takes place. And, and of nature, we could almost, for quite a period of time, just stand around and fellowship with each other. Because the, it's that, that one spirit within us communicating and, and functioning back and forth. And that's why generally somebody has to get up here and go, <coughs> uh, <coughs> we, we, we need to get started now. And, and you know what? Truthfully, it's sometimes difficult when I'm standing up here, or even Bob comes up here, because you see people enjoying that fellowship. They're, they're, they're communicating and, and you know, becoming one, and, and it's sometimes difficult to stop it. It feels awkward because you feel like you're butting in on something wonderful going on. But the nice part is we know we have food afterwards. Hallelujah. That makes it a little bit easier. Amen. And so this isn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the baptism into the body. And um, so when we find out that, that, you know, when at our conversion, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit does four things right off the bat. And, and part of this goes back to, you know, the teaching I had on uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30 where there were things that happened at our salvation, you know, where it says that Christ was made unto us wisdom, uh, sanctification, redemption, and righteousness. This is another thing that happens. So the first thing he does is he gives us a new birth. We're born again. We're made a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. And it talks about that in John 3, 5 and Titus 3, 5. Um, the second thing he does, he comes to indwell us. Romans 8, 9 talks about that, where he comes and resides in us. And... and um, he becomes our Emmanuel, is how I like to say it. He is now God with us by the Spirit of God. Um, the third thing he does is he places us into the body as a member of Christ's body on earth. And that's this area of scripture that we're talking about. And then the fourth thing he does is he seals us as the possession of Christ until the redemption of our human bodies. And, and this, this possession is that word that we talked about, sanctification, where he sets us aside for his personal use. We're his now. We belong to him. And because of that belonging, we're in his body. You know, the scripture tells us that we're in Christ and Christ is in us. And we're already seated at the right hand of God the Father. How much more in him can you be? It's called the in him reality. In him, all of these things take place. You know, in him, we have justification. In him, we have sanctification. In him, we have redemption. All of these things are because of his work that he did on our behalf at that point of salvation and put us in this one wonderful body. Um, and then the scripture goes on to say that we're all made to drink of one spirit all made to drink of one spirit. And, and it's interesting because if we notice, Paul wants us to realize that all are to enjoy this one body or this one reality, that we are one. And, and you know, when we comprehend that, it changes things. We look at things differently. Um, I was going to go to a uh, scripture in the Amplified Bible, John 7, uh, 37 through 39 says, now on the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood up and called out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes in me, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow continually rivers of living water. But he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him as Savior were to receive afterward. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified or raised to honor. And, and so Jesus was speaking of this Spirit to come, the Holy Spirit to come, and, and that's what Paul's talking about here. We are all made to drink of one Spirit. You know, and when, when you, Jesus said, Come unto me who are thirsty and heavy laden, I will give you rest. And, and the nice part about this is, is that that thirst that we now have, that, that God put in us at birth, that, that desire to find him is satisfied. We now can rest in the fact that we're his and he's ours. And so we all at this point get to uh, drink of this spirit. You know, and I, I was talking earlier this morning with some guys and, and, you know, talking about how the difference in my life was, you know, before I was saved, you know, I was living a lifestyle that just was not good. It was destructive. But I didn't want to live that way. I tried to stop doing what I was doing, but I just, I couldn't. It just wasn't, a, I, I couldn't. But when I got saved, I received this spirit. I received this dunamis, it's called, of God, the dynamite of God, that now this power resides within me, that now I have a power that's greater than the power of sin. It's something I didn't have prior to my salvation. And so now I at least had the opportunity, if I chose to use it, to overcome the lies and the deception and the power of sin, that I couldn't overcome without the Spirit of God. You know, and as we drink of this Spirit, it is, the, it is the difference maker. It is what, you know, he's our teacher. He's our comforter. He's our guide. He's the one called alongside to help us. But we have to humble ourselves because I know and there's still times in my life it's like, I got this one, Holy Spirit. You can set this one out. Doesn't end well, generally. I might get halfway up the mountain and tumble down. And so it's, it's, it's something that Paul wanted us to see and recognize and, and comprehend that, that this body is empowered by the Spirit. Christ is the head of it. He's the, 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 the portion of it that gives it direction and is the source of life to it. And just like our head contains the brain, which tells everything else what to do. Amen. And so one of the things that you find out is that, you know, a body with two heads is a freak. You can only have one head. There can only be one thing that leads the body. And we need to make sure that's Jesus Christ. Amen. I was talking with somebody and I said, you know, the biggest thing that should happen in a place of fellowship when the body gets together is that Jesus Christ is glorified and we are made aware of whose we are and who we are and what he would like for us to do. You know, it isn't about me being exalted or glorified. It's about me sharing with you the directives that he's given me for us as a body. That's what it's about. It's about us. You know, and, and I'm of no value without you as far as my teaching gift. What good is it? You know, and I'm not going to say you're of no value without me because that wouldn't be true. So, you know, we're going to go to Romans 12, 4 and 5. And, and like I said, if you, if you ever go into Scripture and, and put in there, the body of Christ or one body, you will be amazed how many times this is brought up in Scripture. A lot. A lot. And, and it, when it's brought up that much, that means that there's something that we need to understand about it. There's something about it that, that's brought out that many times 
um, that we should pay attention to it. So here's Paul now. Now he's writing to the Romans. Last scripture was to the Corinthians. This one's to the Romans. And you'll see a lot of similarities because it's something he wants the people of God to know. For as in one body we have many members. Does that sound familiar? And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. See, we're, we're one body with individual members. It's like our, our natural body has all of these members. It has all of these white blood cells, all of these red blood cells, it has all of these cells of nature. It has you know, all the systems that operate in it that make it a composite whole that you can't subtract one system out of the body or the body will cease to function. Or it won't function with strength. It won't function with the strength it's designed to have. And amazingly, God gave our body some extra parts that you actually can take one part out and still live. There's parts you can donate to somebody else so they can live, and you still get to live too. Amen? And so here we are. We're one body but many parts. And so once again, Paul is relaying this truth to the Christians in Rome that we're one body. And, and I think, you know, a lot of this happens because, you know, the gospel was now going throughout the land. And people were coming together, creating a... a portion of the body in their area. And Paul wanted them to recognize that, hey, listen, you're not an island unto yourself. You have, part of you is in Corinth, part of you is in Galatia, part of you is in here and here and here, and understand that you're one body. But the thing I like about this scripture, it says, but the members do not all have the same function or gift or talents or calling. See, and that's what's so amazing about the body of Christ is, is that, you know, we're not just most moist robots. We all have gifts, we all have talents, we have callings and abilities that this body needs and the body of Christ as a whole needs. You know, that's why quite often we have other members of the body come in and minister to us with their gifts because this body needs that portion of the body. And it's, and it's essential for the health and well-being that, that we do that, because there are gifts and there are talents that, that we need. You know, and, and we find out what happens is when, when we have somebody in to minister to us, we're refreshed, we're built up, we're encouraged, we learn more about who we are. We learn more about who God is. And, and, and that's a strengthening aspect as we work together as a whole to encourage ourselves and grow in grace and build each other up in the faith. And, that, and that's important that we do that. Um, so once again, he says, though many, we are one body in Christ. And, and that's really the theme of it all is that we have to remember that we're one body in Christ. We, we can't, you know, we're not one body in Joseph Smith. We're not one body in Charles Taze Russell, you know. And, and it's interesting because that's when things start to go astray. And, and those are the times that Christianity gets this weird odd look to it and seems very broken and dysfunctional because somebody will say well you know that's the body of Christ but it's actually not because what happens is Jesus Christ is not Lord you know I have a member of my family that's that's part of Jehovah's Witnesses and and of course you know Jesus is a different person than to them than he is to me He's been removed from the scripture, changed in his entity, and then put back into it. And, and do I still love them? Absolutely. They're human beings, and besides that, it's family members. And so love is still the predominant force, but do we have that koinonia fellowship? 
Not really. Not really. But you know what? I'm fully persuaded, because you ask them, well, how are you saved? They'll tell you by the blood of Jesus. But then if you ask them who Jesus is, well, then he's the first thing that God created. See, and, and it just it gets dynamically different. But love is still the basis of all of it. Amen. And so uh, I want to read that out of the Amplified. For just as in one physical body we have many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function or special use, so we, who are many, are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts of one another, mutually dependent on each other. And, and this is important, because this is where the strength comes from. This is where the, the continuity, if, if we will understand that I need you and you need me as, as a whole, and that the strengths that I have, uh, you may be able to draw on, and the strengths that you have, I may be able to draw on. Because I'm not strong in all areas. I may be weak in an area that you're strong in. And if I'll look to you through Christ as the head and allow you to minister to me in my places of weakness, then I get strengthened, and vice versa. And, and it's very important that we, we allow ourselves um, to do that. Here's the problem most generally is we're not very good at exposing our weaknesses because we feel that it makes us lesser of a person. And, of course, you know, in religion, what happens when you expose your weakness is you're, you're either made guilty to feel that way, uh, you're shamed because you feel that way. There's, there's this thing that comes in and triggers that makes you want to close the door on your weaknesses and never expose it. They'll say something to like, well, brother, where's your faith? Aren't you trusting Jesus for that? Well, yeah, I am, but I'm struggling. You know, and I tell you, it was a very freeing day when I was able, to, you're able to walk out into the open and say, hey, you know what, I've got some broken areas. I'm not doing that. I'm doing better than I was, but I'm still not doing as good as I could be. And let the Holy Spirit minister to you sometimes through somebody else. Amen? And you know what? Sometimes the world even ministers to that broken spot. There'll be somebody in the world that'll say something that, that, that will trigger and make sense and touch that spot in your heart because God has his ways. If those, Scripture says, those that seek me, find me. And if you and I are seeking to, to make changes in areas of our lives, God is going to see to it that they get changed, whether he uses another fellow believer, the world system, or the moon and the sun and the stars. He's faithful and he's committed to that body like I spoke of earlier. He's not going to let us fumble around and not live in a way that, that glorifies him and keeps us strong. And that's part of us gathering together is every Sunday, every Wednesday night, every time we're in the scriptures, every time we're in fellowship, God's doing something. There's another piece he's working on. He's, he's taking that, that, that sharp edge off. You know what I mean? That's why scripture talks about iron sharpens iron. And we sharpen each other as we go. So we're needed uh, with each other. And that's what I liked about this part is that we're independently dependent on each other. And sometimes that's hard for us to, to comprehend because if we don't feel that we have something to add, then, then gosh, I hope nobody's depending on me what am I going to be able to add to this situation? Well, probably in your natural man, you may not be able to, but if you allow the Holy Spirit to be the functioning force, he'll speak through you. He'll minister through you, and you'll walk away just as amazed as the other person was. Like, holy smoke, that was cool. I don't even, didn't even know I knew that scripture. Or I hadn't thought of that scripture for years. But the Holy Spirit brings those things back to our remembrance. Amen. That's why it's, we need to know the scriptures. Um, and so, 
this is an area that the devil works overtime in. I'm just telling you. If he can get us fragmented and busted into pieces and then pit us against each other, it certainly is going to cripple up the body of Christ. It really is. And, and unfortunately, he's done a very good job, or we've allowed him uh, to be effective in this area. Because what happens is, in the religious setting, it's competition. Who can have more seats in the chairs? Okay, Whose name's up in the lights? Who's doing more for this? And, and not only is it competition between the different bodies of believers, it's competition in the body, inside the building, where, where they're competing to, uh, you know, to be teacher's pets, to be pastor's pets, you know. And, and it's just sad because that's a worldly way of approaching it. It's just, a, and, and what we find out is it, that's that corrupted system of the tree of the good and evil is what it is. But one thing about grace is we recognize that the cross leveled everything. There is no one greater or lesser in the body of Christ. There just isn't. Now, there's different giftings and different talents, and, and I may be more visible than you are in areas, but then you may be more visible than I am in areas. And so we realize that, that this whole thing has been made level by the cross. God has no favorite children. We're all loved equally. And um, Scripture talks about a house that's divided won't stand. You know, and, and it's a sad thing. You know, when you think about your natural body, there are, there are illnesses that actually take place in your body where your body will start to fight itself. It will literally will fight itself to try and kill itself, kill itself off, because it thinks that the other parts of the body are enemies. And of course, it needs to be fixed or, or it dies. And that's what the devil's done with us, is he's put this, this I'm going to call it a sickness called religion in the body. And it literally is, religion is the sickness, because religion is self-oriented, and it's about self, and when it's about self, then the rest of the body be damned because it's about me. I'm going to lift me up at any cost. And what it does is it just hurts the body. It's destructive to the body. The body starts to eat itself. And, and you know, that's one of the things that, you know, I have the opportunity for me and for you that we gain understanding of this and, and not allow the devil to do that with us. You know, right now at this point, somebody that may watch this teaching, or if I take this message to another body somewhere and teach it, I have opportunity to speak into that situation. But right now I have you guys to, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to work in our lives so that at least we uh, don't give the enemy a foothold in this area. Amen. And, and one thing you find out is that, that healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. The healthier we become, then we get opportunity to speak to brothers and sisters and whoever it might be to help them become healthy. But if we're not healthy, we don't really have much of an opportunity to do that. Amen. Okay, I want to go to the Ephesians. Uh -oh. Ephesians 4.16 From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You know, and, and there's, like I said, there's so many scriptures that, that touch on this subject. It's just all through uh, the New Testament. And, and the part that I want to bring out on this one is it, it talks about how when we're joined together and held together by every joint, which is equipped, and when each part is working properly, that's what we're working on today is try and see what's proper and what's improper for the body. 
when, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And isn't it interesting that love is the catalyst and the glue that makes it all work? See, it's, it's the love of God that allows us to look past a, a doctrine that's error and, and look past that belief system and see a brother and sister and in love, love them. But if we focus on what their air is, or we perceive it to be, then that's going to be what we focus on. And love is not the, the um, force behind it any longer. It's about me trying to get you to see how you're wrong. But when we realize that that's the Holy Spirit's job, our job is to love them. And what happens is, as, the, as we love them, opens the door for the Holy Spirit to minister to them, their lives change because they now comprehend what was there and see the truth. That strengthens the body. It makes the body grow. It makes the body become longer. It's nourishment to the body. Amen? And so we grow up and build itself up in love. And so when each part is working and functioning properly, the body grows. So people say, well, how do you get the body to grow? Well, first of all, love people. Love people. I say, if people walk in here and don't feel the love of God, we're doing something wrong. That should be the first thing they feel when they walk through the door, that God is here and his love is here. And, and if that ever changes, we need to make changes ourselves. Thankfully, it doesn't, because I, people tell us all the time, I feel the love of God here. You know, my desire is that somebody would walk into my home and feel that same love. I have had people tell us that, listen, I know God lives here. You can tell there's an atmosphere in your home, and that's my heart's cry, because it's healthy. That means there's health there. Amen. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. For his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and consistently connected as one. And every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And all these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body. We are all built up and made perfect in love. I love that. I love that. Amen. Colossians 1.18. Like I said, I could, there are so many scriptures I had to try and weed out and find some of them that. And he is the head of the body, the church. You know, it's the first scripture now that, that brings up the word church. Of all the scriptures we've read, this is the first one that says the body and the church are the same thing. The church is the body, and the body is the church. Amen. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And, and this is key to all of this working, is that Jesus Christ is preeminent in all that we do. It really is the first and foremost thing that we need to to do this properly is that Jesus Christ is always first. We always come in second. We never position ourselves above the head. And that's exactly what the devil did in the beginning. He tried to exalt himself above God. And we know how that turned out. Not well. Not well at all. And so, so you know, Christ is the head of the body. It's just like our body. You know, if the head is detached, the body is done. All of the signals and all of the information is no longer able to be relayed to the body. And a body that doesn't have a head sometimes looks like a chicken. It still has impulses and, and muscle memory that makes it run around for a while, but it really is not a living being organism. It's dead. Amen. And so this is really the, the thing that we have to remember. I'm going to read it in the Amplified Bible. He is also the head, the life source, and the leader, 
of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will occupy the first place. He will stand supreme and be preeminent in everything. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. And, and that's what we need to do. And any time somebody tries to put themselves in that position, it doesn't go well. Because what happens is the body isn't healthy. Now, they may be exalted by a people group. They may be exalted by the world system. But as far as the body of Christ, it's not healthy. Because they're not relying on the head any longer. They're relying on a person. You know, and, and that's how it really was in the Old Covenant, is the people of Israel relied on this person called the high priest. And their relationship with God was through this person. And so they would come to God on behalf of their needs for offering for the coverings of sin. And this person, the high priest, would go to God on behalf of the people. And so their needs would be met. Well, the amazing part is, is in the new covenant, that veil that kept the two apart was ripped from top to bottom. And we're not talking about a linen sheet. We're talking about a 12-inch thick veil. And it's amazing. It was ripped from top to bottom, and that was the hand of God doing what he desired from the very beginning. It's just that it took a, a propitiation for that to happen. There was a satisfaction that needed to take place, and when Jesus died, the, the need was met, and now God could open up the Holy of Holies to all of humanity and, and, and made obsolete the system where you came to a person to have a relationship with God. Aren't we thankful for that, that we don't have to go to a sinful man that's broken like we are to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father? We can go right to our Father. We can go to a throne of grace and find mercy in our time of need. And, and that's the exciting part of being part of this body is that we have a loving father that didn't leave us as orphans. He, he, he took us in, gave us a new name, gave us a new beginning, gave us a brand new body, the body of Christ. And, and of course, I think for us, because we've lived with this around us for so long and we're so used to churches on every corner that sometimes the concept of the body of Christ uh, can be kind of veiled to us. And that's why I wanted to stop and, and kind of push it back up to the top so that we could look at it uh, once again and see what a, a wonderful um, place we've been put in this body and that we need each other. And, and I tell people, you know, when... when cause talking to a gentleman and he says you know I was raised this and that and and I got wounded in the church so I just haven't went back and so he says but I pray and and you know I'm still in touch with God and so on and I said well that's wonderful that you're comfortable enough that you know it's a relationship between you and your father it's not a religion it's a relationship I said but the sad reality is there's a body somewhere that's missing your gifts and your talents there's a people group that needs you. You're part of the life-giving source for that people group. And, and they say to me, I've never heard it put that way. Because, see, religion doesn't want you to think that way. Religion wants you to think that the pastor is the life source and you need to come and draw from him. And I remember the days when I was in the church and that's how I felt. I didn't feel like I had anything to offer. I just had to take what was offered me. Well, the very day that I comprehended that and realized, wait a minute now, like the scripture we read says, hey, each one of us has been given a gift and a talent. And it's that composite whole that makes up the body of Christ. There's nobody more valuable or less valuable than anybody. It doesn't matter if you're born again for a day or if you've walked with God for 80 years. There just isn't a value difference. There might be a calling difference. There might be a, a comprehension of the scripture difference. 
But as far as our value, we're all valued the same in Christ. Amen? So, just remember, you're part of an amazing body. And I'm not talking about this one, even though that is true. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Amen? So whether you're here in this facility with us, or you're driving on the road to Rapid City, you're in that body. It's a reality. Amen? And, and we can glorify the head as he, as he nurtures us and influences us by the Holy Spirit. That's what grace is. Grace is that divine influence upon our heart. Amen? Well, where does that divine influence come from? It comes from the head. It comes from the source. And it moves us and it molds us and makes us into the image of his son. Amen? Father, we thank you this morning as we look at this wonderful thing that you orchestrated and organized and put us into called the body. The body of Christ. The body of our Savior. And that he is the head. And we are the hands and the feet. And we're thankful that it was something that you put together and you gifted us with. And I thank you that we have each other, that we're gifted with each other, Lord, and that we walk in love, we walk in mercy, and we walk in grace towards each other as we learn and we grow and we comprehend and, and, and apply ourselves to these truths. So I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters. I thank you that they come and they uh, be a part of what goes on here. And so we just give you praise, Lord Jesus, that um, because of your great love for us, we don't have to fear not knowing what you want this body to do, whether corporately or individually, that you're more than enough to speak to our heart and influence us and take us to the place that we need to be that our gifts and our talents are given to us by you, empowered by you, and we desire to see them operate and function not only in this body as a whole, but in our lives individually, Father God. And so as always, we pray in the name that's above every name, every circumstance, every situation that can arise in our lives, the precious and holy and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. If anybody needs prayer, let me know. Don't leave here if you got a prayer or need something. Let's go to God together and agree with him over what he says.